Y'all are going to get tired of me this Sunday. (sighs) All right, my friends. My name is Pastor Anne Marie, and we are so grateful that you decided to worship with us this morning. It is the first week of November. And so I am just going to name the elephant in the room for us this morning. They have already started playing Christmas music in stores. (laughs) No, with the first week of November comes a lot of big decisions. And so I hope that you might use your ability to vote this week prayerfully, thoughtfully, compassionately, and that whatever happens, my friends, that you might remember, whoever is in the Oval Office, we know who's on the throne. Amen. But back to the matter at hand, that, does, that is worthy of applause. But back to the matter at hand, I heard all I want is Christmas is you in, in the store yesterday. All right. Strolling through Target and I heard the dulcet tones of mistletoe by Justin Bieber. Something is coming, my friends. The holidays are just around the corner, and that might mean some different things for all of us. When you think about the holiday season, maybe you reflect fondly on that time together with family. Maybe you love to see the decorations start to go up. Maybe you look forward to finding the perfect gift for each person. And if you're anything like me, you look forward to the food. Because I have found there are two different kinds of food, especially at the holidays. There are kinds of food that are good for the body. There are kinds of food that are good for the soul. And blessedly, in this space, we get to focus a little bit more on the soul. And so I want us to think about how when we create food, when we piece together a recipe, when we follow trustworthy instructions, it's not unlike how we craft our Christian journey. It's not unlike the walk of faith. It involves following those good instructions, bringing things together, being creative and diligent, and making something to be shared. When we think about it, the process of creating good food is a lot like the process of creating a good or holy life. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about our recipes for the good life as we approach this holiday season. We're going to be talking about how we grow in faith, how we follow God's call, how we know we are making something that is nourishing for the soul. So this morning, we begin by considering those recipes that are good for life start by following trustworthy instructions. They start by following a good recipe. So we're gonna begin this morning in scripture in the Gospel of Matthew chapter one. As Matthew shares the beginning of Jesus' story, a little bit of the recipe for how Jesus came to be. It goes like this, beginning in Matthew chapter one, verse one. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I planned that for dramatic effect. (laughs) Verse 2 says, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, Perez and the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Amidav, and Amidav the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. How are we doing? We got 15 more verses. Are you guys ready? We're not going to do that. We're going to skip down to the end. Coming back in verse 16, it says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, who bore Jesus, is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. So Matthew has this unique challenge. He's going to share with the world this life-changing story. 
And he has to think about how is he going to present it to the world, this story that will go on to inspire billions, to change the course of history. And he starts it with a project not unlike what Bill was speaking about earlier, a family tree. And we'll get into a little bit of the why of that later, but I want us to notice how Matthew details the story that leads to Christ. How precise he is with each word. How intentional each name is. If you get into the weeds of it, even the math in the generations matters. And all this careful precision and all of the things that come together are not unlike how you might plan a recipe. You want those careful and precise and accurate instructions. Because at their best, recipes are meant to be written and read carefully. This is something that I learned in the eighth grade when I decided to make brownies for a special event. And I was ready. I had the box and I had the ingredients and I had a plan. And so I started to, to put everything together. And I realized the only thing I didn't have was vegetable oil. But I had olive oil. And aren't those kind of the same? <laughs> Allow me to spare you. They are not the same. <laughs> because you know what happens when you fill a brownie mix full of olive oil? Your brownies taste like olive oil. But what was I to do with my newly made creation but clean up the mess that I had made, wrap up those brownies, and this is a true story, and bring them to the church for the bake sale? In other news, next Saturday, we are having a bake sale as part of our holiday extravaganza. I will not be baking for it. You're all welcome. But it matters that we follow instructions, that those instructions are careful and precise, that most of all, they are trustworthy. And I love that the commentary writers on this text are always quick to point out that, yes, sometimes this text is not super exciting to read. But for the people who heard it in that first century, they would have been on the edge of their seats. Because with each name brought up a story, these are people that they knew, that are part of their spiritual and maybe even literal history. And so we're gonna spend just a little bit of time noticing the different pieces in the recipe that led to Jesus and what it has to teach us about his ministry and who he came to be. In that first verse, it says, an account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Every Jewish person at the time might have considered themselves a son or a daughter of Abraham. But being reminded in this way brings up something specific. For the last two weeks, we've been talking about covenants and the importance of God's promises for God's people. And when you hear son of Abraham, their first thought would have been that same promise made to Abraham so many years ago, that God was promising Abraham a place and a people and a purpose, and that through his family, the whole world would be blessed. And that little bit of ingredient teaches us something about who Christ will go on to be. And in the same way, we see that Jesus is named the son of David. And this is a more specific, maybe even more desirable lineage, but like Abraham, noting that Jesus is the son of David connects back to another promise, that from the line of David would come a king whose kingdom would be full of peace and whose reign would be, would be without end. And then we know something else about who Jesus was coming to be. And then there's something really different. Throughout Jesus' lineage, lineage Matthew peppers in women. He lists Tamar and Rahab 
and Ruth and Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. And not only is he breaking the norm by naming these women, but he names bad women. Women attached to scandal. Women associated or themselves people outside of the Jewish heritage, people outside God's chosen people. And so we see Jesus as coming from this family that routinely brought in outsiders into the family of God, people who have messy lives and even messier families. The holidays are approaching. Does anybody relate to that? And over and over we see them brought in not even just brought in, but celebrated, put into this lineage. And among each generation that's named, we see a God who moves through, moves through and uses unexpected people at unexpected times for unexpectedly beautiful purposes. And so by the time you reach the end of that genealogy, which if you have some time on this maybe rainy afternoon, I invite you to read all 17 verses They're riveting. But you might come up with a recipe that looks something like this. You might say, to get to the line of Jesus, you need one cup of covenant promise to be a family through whom the whole world would be blessed. You need one cup of covenant promise that from David's line would come a messianic king whose kingdom would be without end. You need four teaspoons of people, specifically women, from outside the Jewish line, not just being allowed in, but named and celebrated. You need a healthy dash of reminders that God moves powerfully, often through those in this world without power. And all of a sudden, we take this recipe and we start to know what Jesus' life and ministry will look like, what sort of shape it'll take. Because we can see the instructions that he's following. We can see who he's following. My friends, who are you following? On this All Saints Sunday, the time that we have set apart to remember our friends and family in the faith who have passed on during the last year, I wonder, whose example are you following? What does your recipe for faith look like? If you train for a new sport, it's not uncommon to get a coach. If you want to get further in your career, maybe you get a mentor further along in their field. If you want to grow in your faith, who are you looking to? What examples are you following? Where are you getting your inspiration? What does your recipe look like? Because if cooking, if soul food can teach us anything, it's that the instructions that we use will lead us to what we create. That what we follow matters. That's what Linda noticed one day. Linda is a United Methodist pastor in Washington State, where she has served for over 20 years, but I met her only a few weeks ago as we journeyed to Sager Brown. And her church and our church were very blessed to serve alongside each other during that week. But she told me during our time together that over the last 20 years, she has developed a certain habit when it comes to her pastoral appointment. So each year, the bishop can move or keep you at your current appointment, And with each time she's moved, Linda has a tradition. She would come to church, and she would bake her mom's biscuits. And then she would serve them on her first communion Sunday. That's holy applause. (laughs) Can y'all tell, Linda lives in Washington State, but she serves biscuits at communion. She's from the South. We just, like, let her go. But she said she got a new appointment last summer. And so she arrived at that church and she gathered her ingredients. 
She got the butter and the milk and the eggs and she put them together and as she reached out to grab the dough to start preparing it for the tray, she looked down and she saw her mom's hands. And I wonder if that's ever happened to you. She looked down and somehow in the course of the years of making those biscuits and following her mom's instructions over and over and over, she looked down in the hands that she had were the hands her mom had in her childhood memories. And I love how she explained her reaction to me. She said she looked down and she was surprised. But then she thought, isn't this how it's supposed to be when we follow Jesus? We go about his call. We follow his instructions. We assemble the things that he asks us to, love and grace and self-sacrifice and holiness. And all of a sudden, we might look down and see Jesus' hands. Friends, I wonder, on this All Saints Sunday, who who are you following? What do your instructions look like? May we all have the courage to follow a recipe that's good for the soul. Amen. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we give you thanks this morning for your presence here with us. God, that you've called us here together to testify to your goodness, to be surrounded by your love, God, to grow in your grace. God, as we celebrate our saints, We ask that you would help us to remember them well, to follow their good examples, that we might shine like lights of your love in this world. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.